Always read the Old Testament with New Testament eyes. If the gospel really is good news for us, we should share it and share it cheerfully. Men are not saved by Christ's death alone. Men are saved by hearing and believing the gospel. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The Greek word apostolos, apostolos means one who is sent as a messenger or a representative. It can mean a delegate to a certain cause. An envoy is a diplomat or an agent who speaks on behalf of a government or perhaps an organization to promote or bring attention to a certain cause. Paul said he was chosen by Christ to speak on behalf of the kingdom of God to promote the gospel. Christianity is not so much the beginning of a new religion, but the fulfillment of an ancient one. So the gospel, he tells us in verse 3, is about, it's concerning God's Son, who was born, he says, of the lineage of David. Notice Romans chapter 1, verse 4, that Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by His resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be, he was born of the lineage of David, but he was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. The Greek word for declared, and this is the English Standard Version, the Greek word declared is the word horizo. Horizo. It's where we get the English word horizon. And it basically means a boundary. However, in this context, it means to be defined, to be shown, or to be proven. He was shown to be, he was defined this way, he was proven to be. The resurrection is unmistakable proof that Jesus was not an ordinary man. That he was and is the unique Son of God. That's what he's saying. Now, other people had come back to life from the dead before Christ. Jesus himself raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, also, uh, the son of the widow at Nain and Jairus' daughter. Then in the Old Testament, uh, Elijah raised uh, the widow woman's son from the dead. And in 2 Kings 13, verse, around verse 21, uh, a dead man was thrown hastily on the bones of Elisha, and he revived and came back to life. But none of those people were resurrected. See, they all eventually died, and they're not with us. Lazarus is not with us today. You see, Jesus did not... This is fundamental. You, you, you should know this as a Christian. Jesus did not merely revive from death. You know, his heart stopped beating, and then it started again. He was glorified. He was the first and currently the only person who was glorified. He had a tangible physical body that could be touched. They saw the, the print of the nails in his hand. But his body was perfect and immortal. So in the days of his flesh, the gospel tells us, Jesus had to eat. He was, he was thirsty. He, had, he told the lady at the well, give me something to drink. He was tired. He was sleeping in the boat. But after his resurrection, he did, he could eat a piece of broiled fish to prove his identity, that it was really him, but he doesn't need food and rest to sustain him. And though he could be seen, he could also disappear at will. He walked right through a door. And then in the end, probably 
the most staggering miracle of all. In the presence of all his disciples in a physical, tangible body, he ascended up into heaven. They saw him until he could not be seen. Hallelujah. Amen. That all of these things prove that he was and is the Son of God. And in verse 5, Romans 1, 5, Paul says that we, notice he doesn't say I, but he says we have received grace and apostleship through him. It all comes through him, through the one who was raised from the dead. So that means Paul was not the only one who was a special envoy from heaven. There were others who were called and who were equipped to promote the gospel. And he says in verse 5 that his purpose was to bring about the obedience of faith. Paul, in this verse and other places, he defines faith in God as obedience to the gospel. So Bible faith, New Testament faith, is not believing whatever you wish. That's why a lot of people are disappointed in life. They thought that was faith, but it's not New Testament faith. It's not Bible faith. Hmm? Faith, New Testament faith, Christian faith, is a willing and submitted attitude in response to the message of Christ. So that means the gospel is always central to our faith. See, some people are trying to believe things apart from the gospel. And once again, that's why it doesn't work for them. Amen? Whatever you believe that is not in line with the gospel is foolish and futile. Apart from the cross, God can do nothing for you. So you can talk about how good God is. You can talk about how merciful He is. You can talk about how wonderful He is. Yes, amen, He is. But if you remove the gospel, you remove the cross, you remove the blood, you will never experience His goodness. You will never experience His grace. You will never experience His wonders. Amen. See, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, for all the promises of God find their yes in Him meaning in Christ. They find, they are answered in Christ. See, sometimes people read Old Testament scriptures, and yes, that's God's word, but they do not connect the dots. They don't see how every promise in the Old Testament, when Paul says all the promises, that has to be the Old Testament because that's the only promises they had when he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. They didn't have any other promises besides that. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. He's writing it. All the promises would have to include the Old Testament. All of them were fulfilled at the cross. All of them find their fulfillment in your life through the cross. You have to connect the dots. Amen? So, always read the Old Testament with New Testament eyes. Read it with an understanding of what Christ has accomplished for us. See, Paul served God, for God is my witness whom I serve. I serve God. How? By proclaiming the gospel. Paul didn't preach for the sake of holding a meeting. He was always looking for positive results, a change in people's lives. We judge the success of anything we do in ministry by changed lives. And what Paul shared with the saints was also in line with the gospel. The message, the teaching, the instruction that he shared with believers was a natural outgrowth of the gospel. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27 and 28. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. And our attitude in clearing this gospel debt should be one of urgency, not procrastination. 
And Paul said, I'm a debtor to Greeks and barbarians. Now, when I hear the word barbarian, I think of a caveman-like person who's crude, rude, socially unacceptable, a savage guy who you know, just, just kills animals with his bare hand and drinks the blood. I think of something like that, you know, barbarians at the gates of Rome. But it doesn't mean that. Barbarian in the Greek simply means one who does not speak Greek. A non-Greek speaker, right? So really what he's saying is, I'm not just indebted to the people that speak the same language as me. Or really more than that, I'm not just indebted to those who share my culture. See, some people say, I have a real burden for the people in my community. Wonderful. But if you want to be like Paul, even those who are not part of your community, you owe them the gospel. In other words, even people who are not like you, who are very different from you, you have a debt. We have a debt. Not just you, but we all have a debt. And he says both to the wise and to the foolish. So basically that means all classes of people. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, Paul, God's envoy to promote the cause of Christ, said this, 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. In other words, Paul, he's all about the gospel, and he tried to find common ground with everybody he met. He endeavored to be relatable. See, if I tell a story that's something that you've never experienced and you, you don't even understand what it is, it, it doesn't really make sense to you, then it se that story seems irrelevant. But if I can share something that you've also experienced, you right away can see yourself in that story. It's relatable. And the reason he became relatable, he endeavored to relate to people, is so that his message would be relevant to all men. He was adaptable. He never changed his message, but he often changed his approach. One reason why we're not more effective is we're inflexible. So instead of insisting that everybody adapt to what we want, we should endeavor to be more accommodating to others, to meet them at some place where we have common ground. Romans 1.15, for I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Paul was enthusiastic about sharing the gospel. The Weymouth translation says, for my part, I am willing and eager. In other words, as far as I'm concerned, that's my attitude. The people that hear me, well, some of them are not willing. Some of them are not so eager. Right? Some of them arrested Paul, some of them threw him in jail, some of them beat him. But he always had the same positive, enthusiastic attitude about the gospel. Amen. If the gospel really is good news for us, we should share it and share it cheerfully. Most people wait until it's time to act and then start making preparations. Right? So be ready. So when it comes to the gospel, are you ready to share it? Because opportunity often strikes when we are least expecting it. Proverbs 11.30 says, he who wins souls is wise. I think we read that and thought it says, he who wins souls is noble. Yeah, maybe, but it says wise. It takes wisdom to share the gospel successfully, effectively. It takes wisdom. And wisdom is always preparing for the future. Verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was proud of the good news in a wholesome way. 
in a good way, not in a bad way, in in a positive way. He was proud of the good news. It was not something he was embarrassed to talk about. Now, if something disgraceful happens uh, to you, you probably want to keep it a secret. Why was he not ashamed? Because the gospel is God's power. Men are not saved by Christ's death alone. If that was the case, the whole world would be saved automatically because Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Men are saved by hearing and believing the gospel. So notice he didn't say the cross of Christ is the power of God. He actually said the story of the cross is the power of God. Nobody can be saved without the gospel. They have to know it. They have to accept it. They have to believe it. They have to act on it. Or as Paul said, they have to obey the gospel. And the power of the gospel is activated by faith. The gospel is God's power to save everyone, but not just everyone, everyone who believes. So faith is a catalyst. It's that one missing ingredient that triggers a powerful explosion. The gospel, we could say, is the dynamite. Your faith is the lit fuse.